which Shotokan founder Gichin Funakoshi really hated his own style as it exists today, was Judo founder Jigoro Kano really buried with his white belt, to kick off the launch of our brand new website and the release of our new Forefather shirt series, we thought it would be fun to take a quick look at some historical nuggets of these masters and separate truth from mythology. When it comes to names in karate history, few are recognizable as the name Miyagi. Now for many outside the martial circle or as young children in the 80s, the name Miyagi was synonymous with Pat Morita's portrayal of the karate master in the Karate Kid franchise. Now, those in the martial arts, however, know that he was based on the real life grandmaster Chojin Miyagi. Taking his experience in the original Okinawan system of Nahate, Miyagi added his own influences and founded what is known today as Goju Ryu. Literally translating to hard soft style, it's interesting to know that it got its name somewhat by accident. As it's generally documented, Miyagi was invited to Tokyo in 1930 to demonstrate at a martial arts convention. However, unable to attend, he sent one of his senior students, Shinzato Jinan, in his stead. Now Shinzato impressed those in attendance, and at the end of the demonstration, officials were asking him the name of the style he had just performed. There was just one problem. Miyagi had not designated a name. So in an attempt to avoid embarrassment or to have them look down on his master system, he improvised on the spot and he referred to it as Hanko Ryu or Half Heart Style. Upon returning to Okinawa, he informed Miyagi of this, who then wanted to elaborate on his designation. He turned to a famous text of poems called the Kempo Haiku and drew influence from the third verse, which reads, The way of exhaling and inhaling is hardness and softness. Now this name is highly appropriate to describe the heavy emphasis on breathing and the balance between linear and circular techniques. So last year we released the History of Gojuru documentary and along with that a Chojin Miyagi commemorative shirt. Now we had an outpouring of positive feedback from the episode and requests for more shirts, so we listened. We are pleased to reveal our new Forefather series that commemorates the legacy and impact of these masters and that what they've left upon the martial arts. Now the first four shirts are available now on our brand new website and store, artofondojo.com. Now, this collection also includes a remastered version of Chojin Miyagi, as well as Judo founder Jigoro Kano, Shotokan founder Gichin Funakoshi, and Wing Chun Grandmaster Ip Man. In addition to that, we have eight more masters that will be released in the next several weeks, so this catalog will continue to expand. Now, I'm going to be honest and fully upfront with all of you. We love doing this channel, but we are a small operation, and we put in full-time hours on this project in addition to full-time jobs. So there are schools that we'd like to visit and topics we want to address, but we need help to do that. And we thought that by providing our own site would first help offset the cost of this channel, second, offer ways for our viewers to proudly display their own arts and philosophies, and finally, to create options for us to do more with this channel. So I sincerely, sincerely appreciate all the support you show us, and I hope you enjoy these shirts, especially for the holiday season. They make great last minute gifts. Now there's a link in the description below underneath the video, or you can just go to artofondoja.com to check them out. So since we're talking about names, let's segue into Shotokan. It's well known that the name actually stemmed from founder Gichin Funikoshi's pen name as a poet. He wrote under the name Shoto, which means pine waves. Now he adopted the moniker as he observed the wind blowing through the pine trees during the time he spent in the mountains writing his poetry. However, while he founded the art of Shotokan by taking his Okinawan training and adapting it into a modified style that he felt was better suited for Japan, he never actually gave the art a name. He simply referred to it as Karate. The name arose from his students addressing the physical dojo. Kan means hall, so his students would go to the Shotokan, or Hall of Pine Waves. Now, this bit of trivia is pretty well known in the martial arts. However, what is lesser known is that perhaps Funakoshi himself didn't approve of this name. There is a quote often attributed to him that says, There is no place in contemporary karate do for different schools. Some instructors I know claim to have invented new and unusual kata, and so they arrogate to themselves the right to be called founders of schools. Indeed, I have heard myself and my colleagues refer to as the Shotokan school, but I strongly object to this attempt at classification. My belief is that these schools should be amalgamated into one so that the Karate Do may pursue an orderly and useful progress into man's future. Not only that, but there is evidence to suggest that he also did not like the path the art itself was taking. Now there are two distinct styles of Shotokan that stand out. The first by Ginchin Funakoshi as he attempted to preserve and import the Karate he learned, and the second modified version developed and propagated by his son Gigo. Gigo placed greater emphasis on the lower stances, hip generated power, and competitive fighting, very different than his father's teachings. So it's hard to know exactly how Gishin Funakoshi felt about this, but in one of his preserved and more recent poems, A Full Determination, he wrote, On the island to the sea to the south, there is transmitted an exquisite art. This is karate. 
To my great regret, the art has declined and its transmission is in doubt. Who would undertake the monumental task of restoration and revival? This task I must undertake. Who would if I didn't? I vowed to the blue sky. Was he talking about the disapproval of the direction that his art was going? Now, I invite scholars much more knowledgeable than myself to shed some more light on the subject. Regardless, we can't ignore the absolutely legendary stamp Funakoshi left on the martial arts. Shotokan went on to spread globally and become the foundation for several amazing arts that we have today. And he certainly wasn't the only one who left a mark. Judo founder Jigoro Kano created many traditions that became embedded in karate today as we know it. Namely, he introduced the gi as the formal training uniform. Taking the traditional Japanese kimono and altering it with tougher material suitable for tugging and pulling, he created what is now the most traditional uniform in karate. He also created the belt ranking system that we see today. Taking influence from Japanese swim teams who were said to have awarded expert swimmers with black armbands to show their proficiency, it is believed that Kano applied the same sentiment to his students, providing a black belt to those who show sufficient skills. So the myth of the black belt that was just a white belt that got dirty over time, that's just a myth. The original ranks were no belt and belt, so black belt was the first rank. And as time progressed, the white and brown belts were added, and as this trend cut on, the, the full spectrum of colors were introduced. But Kano was also credited with another act that may fall myth side. Legend tells that on his deathbed, Kano was surrounded by many top students, and he expressed his wish to be buried with his white belt to symbolize forever being a student. Now, that sounds romantic and insightful. However, there are three problems with this claim. First is that Kano did not die surrounded by his students. He passed away in 1938 while on ship at sea, not in the presence of his students. The second issue is Japan cremates their dead and Kano was not buried. And finally, Kano came from traditional jiu-jitsu training that utilized a more familial structured ranking and he technically didn't hold official Dan ranking. So it would have been hard for him to be buried in his white belt when he wasn't even buried and didn't even have a white belt. It's easy to understand though why an idea like this would stick. Jigoro Kano's influence on Japanese martial arts spans an incredible reach. His traditions became so well ingrained that they even traveled back to Okinawa where older karate styles adopted them. His legacy should be celebrated and memorialized. And this brings us to Ip Man, who is a unique addition to today's video. He's the only one in on his list who is the most recognizable and monumental figure in his art, despite not being the founder of the art. It would be fair to say that Ip Man is the face of Wing Chun, and his teachings have spanned generations, navigated around the globe, and created some of the fiercest competition in system lineage. His legacy has been inspiration for several films, including the Ip Man quadrilogy starring Donnie Yen. Now, well, Yen is an accomplished martial artist in his own right, and the films are entertaining, they leave a lot to be desired for historical accuracy. Ip Man was not documented to have fought a Japanese general, did not take on a room full of black belts, and despite what the fourth film portrayed, he never even stepped foot in America. One of the most disputed legends of Wing Chun may be actually its origin. The general legend, as it's told, depicts a tale of the burning of Shaolin Temple, the escape of five elders, and a nun teaching a woman by the name of Yin Wing Chung how to fight and defeat a local bully. Now this is often generally accepted history, however, there is very little historical evidence to back this up. There are documents found after the death of Ip Man that outline this tale, and it is believed that that was part of an effort to form a unified Wing Chun organization. However, details of the story have no further verification, and this document stands as the oldest record of this telling. Scholars have investigated, and not only have they not been able to confirm this, there was no burning of the Shaolin Temple, and the nun bears too much resemblance to other female folklore heroes. So this is a great example of how easily a legend can take over, and in an art as old as Wing Chun and the early history was told verbally for generations, it may be fully impossible to know the true origin. What we do have, however, is Ip Man's teaching, which stands as a pillar in the art of Wing Chun and established its place in modern martial arts. He was the first to widely open training to the public and has definitely earned his place as a forefather in the martial arts. So what can we take away from all of this? I personally find martial arts history fascinating, however, if we're not careful, it can act as a poison and promote toxicity. It's a good idea to know how much history in the art exists that you train in, however, it's far more important to understand the meaning of what's being taught. If you want to honor these legacies, then it's about how to take their teaching and carrying it forward into the future and using it not only to better your own life, but those you influence as well. And that's why we want to honor these men today, for their everlasting imprint on the arts. So please visit our new website, artofonedoja.com, or click right here and pick up your shirt today, or grab a holiday gift for a loved one. Your support means a lot to us, and it's the viewers like you that help make this channel what it is today, and makes me super excited to carry this forward into the future. Thank you so much.